Hi friends, welcome to my recap of Watchtower Study Article 20. This is for the week of July 22nd, 2024. We are in the middle of summer here in the States and where I live, it is hot. Today, I think we were at about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's around 35 degrees Celsius. It is just too much. And of course, I do not love the heat, but it is what it is and it was a beautiful day. We are going to recap these changes that are going on with Watchtower. We learned about the changes in their um, interpretation of the resurrection, that maybe some people will now be resurrected who they thought may not be resurrected. <clears throat> But we know that Acts 24 clears it up and tells us that there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust, period. So this shouldn't even be in question. But we're going to get into it. This article, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Isaiah 43.10. You are my witnesses, says Jehovah. We're going to take a look at that, put it into context. And really the entire context of this article is time is running out. So in other words, if the witnesses are starting to doubt the governing body members because of all of these ridiculous changes, they're going to put the fear of God into them in this article. All right, so let's get into it. At the 2023 annual meeting, we received thrilling clarifications on some of our beliefs, and we heard some exciting announcements about our ministry. We learned, for example, that some individuals may have an opportunity to side with Jehovah's people even after Babylon the Great is destroyed. We also learned that as November 2023, Kingdom Publishers would no longer be asked to report all their activity in the ministry. With each passing day, our ministry becomes more urgent. Why? Because time is running out. Consider what Jesus foretold about the preaching work in the last days. So they cite Mark 13, 10, there it is, but listen, Jesus was not speaking about the Jehovah's Witness preaching work. That's important to know. Look at what's underlined in paragraph three. Why do we preach the good news? Put simply, love motivates us to preach. What we do in the preaching work reflects our love for the good news, our love for people, and our love for Jehovah and his name. Look at these photos. I took these photos myself, right? So here you have two witnesses sitting on a bench or maybe they took their chairs, I can't remember, with an umbrella, and you see the arrow, you see how far the cart is to them? Now I want you to know where they're sitting, it's on a bike path. They're motivated by love to sit 15 feet away from their cart that's posted on a bike path. Now there are people who jog by, some who walk by, but they're sitting there. now. How are they showing love? Listen, if they had such an important message, wouldn't they be shouting it from the rooftops? Instead, they're doing their duty in the easiest way possible. I remember, because I used to do the same thing. We didn't have carts when I was a witness, but depending upon who I was coupled with in the ministry, I would barely knock on the door because frankly, I didn't want to talk to anybody at the door. I was not a good Jehovah's Witness because I didn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness. I just did it because I had to. So we're gonna to jump to paragraph five. Think back to how you felt when you first learned the truth. Listen, this is not the truth, okay? From God's word. You discovered that your heavenly father loves you, that's true that he wants you to be part of his family of worshipers. That's false. He wants you to be in the body of Christ. And there's the verses to look at that. Okay, moving on in the green, he's promised to end pain and suffering. True, that you can hope to see your dead loved ones come back to life in a new world. That's false. There's your verses. Most importantly, Hebrews 9:27 as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. The paragraph continues, those truths warmed your heart. You loved what you were learning. Very hypnotic. These witnesses are even told what they are to think, how they are to feel, how they are to behave. 
it's appointed ju just as Jesus died once for the sins of mankind and was raised from the dead, so it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. There's no second chances to be resurrected onto this new world to learn from Jehovah's Witnesses and this great uh, educational opportunity to teach them about their God. You see, they have to teach them about their God because their God is not the God of the Bible. Their God is found in Watchtower literature. Their God has been around in this persona for what, 150 years? This Jehovah's Witness God, it's a copycat. He's not the God of the Bible. All right, paragraph six. Consider an experience. A brother named Ernest was about 10 years old when his father died. Here we go. Ernest recalls, I wondered, has he gone to heaven or has he ceased to exist forever? I envied other children who still had a father. He'd regularly go to the cemetery, kneel at his father's grave and pray, please God, I wanna know where my dad is. About 17 years after his father died, Ernest was offered a Bible study, which he accepted. He was thrilled to learn that the dead are unconscious as, as if in a deep sleep and that the Bible promises a future resurrection. So notice Ecclesiastes 9, 5, what's underlined, it says, the dead know not anything neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. So it's talking about, you know what? The living know that death is coming, right? But the dead don't. The dead are conscious of nothing under the sun because they've already died. There's no, the, there's no more opportunity for the dead to have a reward. The, book of Ecclesi the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes is under the sun. It doesn't mean soul sleep. It doesn't mean that they cease to exist. You have to put it in context. All right, paragraph seven. Clearly, when love for Bible truth takes root in our heart, we cannot keep silent. We feel like the first century disciples of Jesus who said we cannot stop speaking about the things we've seen and heard. Acts 4.20. We love the truth so much that we want to share it with as many as possible. You have to understand that Acts chapter four, verse 20, what they could not they could not stop preaching about was Christ's death, burial, and therefore his bodily resurrection from the dead. That's what they couldn't stop preaching about. At the end of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they had scattered when Christ died, but guess what? He rose bodily from the dead, conquering death. And what happens? The book of Acts opens up and the, the disciples and Peter, they're in Jerusalem speaking to millions of people because millions of people had made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem because it was Passover. It was required that the heads of households of the Jewish families came to Jerusalem. Why are they so boldly speaking? Because Christ rose from the dead. You cannot apply Acts chapter four to Jehovah's Witnesses sitting on a bench in the shade with a cart that's 15 feet away from them, staring at the people who ride by on their bikes. You cannot compare the two. Paragraph eight in the box, it starts with, we feel deep compassion for those who are without God and who have no hope. That's the way a Christian should feel, okay? They are drowning in life's problems. We have the life vest that they need. No, the good news of God's kingdom. Our love and compassion for such ones motivates us to make every effort to reach them with the good news. And then they have this, um, new brochure, right? Leading people to JW.org. Our love for people also moves us to warn them about the approaching end of this wicked world. We have pity for our neighbors and our unbelieving family members. Many go about their daily lives unaware of what's coming. A great tribulation such, such as is not occurred. So here is the verse. What's underlined? God said, oh thou, you, O son of man, meaning Ezekiel, 
You shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. If you don't speak to warn the wicked from his way, his blood will I require at your hand. So remember when we believed that we were blood guilty if we didn't speak to our relatives? I remember that very clearly. But this warning at Ezekiel 33, that was from God to Ezekiel to speak to the Jews. If Ezekiel refused, God would require Ezekiel's blood. That doesn't apply to us. Ezekiel was a prophet chosen by God to warn the exiles. Christ's blood was shed to satisfy the requirement, not ours. God does not hold us blood guilty if we don't preach to people. That's a cheap shot watchtower. As explained in the preceding article, here you have speculation. It may be Jehovah's will to save people who have a change of heart when they see the destruction of Babylon the Great. If so, then it's all the more urgent that we keep sounding the warning. This is all speculation. They don't even know. I wonder if the witnesses recognize this. It may B, Jehovah's will. Paragraph 11, the most important reason why we preach the good news is that we love Jehovah and his holy name. We view our ministry as a way to praise the God we love. We wholeheartedly agree that Jesus, not Jehovah God, the God of Watchtower, is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power from his loyal worshipers. Why do I say that? They cite Revelation 4.11, but put it into context. What? Look what's underlined. The four beasts say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, which is, and is to come. Who's that? Jesus was, right? He walked the earth. He died. He was resurrected bodily, so he is. And guess what? He is to come. The God of Watchtower is not coming again. The only one who's coming again is Jesus. Look at verse 11 in bold that they cite. You, Jesus, are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Read the book of John. Jesus is the creator. All things were created by him and for him. The God of this organization is, is an imposter. It's no wonder they despise Jesus. It's no wonder they diminish him to a mere man, to a mere good teacher. All right, paragraph 12, we're gonna take this in sections, okay? It says, our love for Jehovah moves us to sanctify his name, Matthew 6, 9. We want to have a part in clearing his name of the reproach that Satan has brought on it by his malicious lies. That is not what happened in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 1 through 5, let's look at this. You see in red there? And he said, meaning the serpent, unto the woman, yea, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, how is that bringing reproach on their God's name? The serpent questioned God and he caused doubt. That's what happened. Yea, has God said, you should not eat of the tree of life. He actually spoke truth but he questioned it. There was no bringing reproach on God's name. The devil is a created being. God created him. All right, let's keep going in the paragraph. So the next thing they cite in green is Job 2.4. How does this support that God's name needs to be cleared? And then they cite John 8.44 in blue. What's underlined, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Where do these verses say that God's name needs to be cleared and sanctified? They don't. Jehovah's Witnesses are walking around 
trying to clear and sanctify their God's name. It, it wasn't an issue in the Garden of Eden. Their God is an imposter. That's why there's so much fear and confusion in the organization. Let's keep going in the paragraph. What's underlined in pink? In our ministry, we are eager to stand up for our God. That's right. Their God is a different God. Telling the truth about him to all who will listen. The rest of the paragraph proves that they're standing up for their God. Because what's underlined, they say that his way of ruling, their God's way of ruling, is righteous and just, and that his kingdom will soon end all suffering and bring peace and happiness to the human family. When we defend Jehovah's reputation in our ministry, we sanctify our name. Look at what I wrote right next to it. Jesus is the king. It's Christ's millennial reign. It's not Jehovah's kingdom, the God of this organization. I think that John 8, 44 refers to the God of their organization because this paragraph just spoke lies. Nowhere in scripture does God need people to defend his reputation. This is just so sad. So if a Jehovah's Witness does not tell the truth about their God, does this mean that they are of the devil who is the father of the lie? All right, so now we're gonna take a look at Isaiah 43. So I've crossed out Jehovah, the God of this organization, has called us to be his witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses penned, of course, by Rutherford. So let's look at Isaiah 43, 10 through 12. Ye are my witnesses, says the Lord. Look at in blue. Besides me, there is no savior. You see 1 John 4, 14? We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So if the Son is the Savior, then who is Isaiah 43 verse 11 speaking about? It's Jesus. Who is the Lord? Jesus. Keep going on. Verse 13 in green. Before the day was, I am he. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Doesn't that make sense that Jesus is God, not a God? Because if John tells us that there's only one true God and Jesus is a God, does that mean he's a false God? It doesn't make sense. And you know, of course, that the John 1.1 1, 1 was taken from Johannes Grieber's Bible. Um, he, his wife was a spirit medium and the demons actually told his wife what to tell her husband to put in that Bible. John 1.1 1, 1, in translating Jesus as ego, as a God is a demonic translation. I did a video on this friends. I'll put it on the screen after this video. All right, back to Isaiah 43 in purple. There is no, no one that can deliver out of my hand. Look at John 10, 28. Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You see in the orange, John 1, John the Baptist, verse seven, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. We are to bear witnesses of the light. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the savior of the world. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the Lord. Isaiah 43, verse 10. All right, paragraph 14 in the box. Also, we are thrilled at the possibility that even during the darkest time in human history, the great tribulation, we may see still more people turn away from Satan's dying world 
They don't even know. They are speculating about what may occur. Paragraph 15, meanwhile, we have work to do. We have the privilege of sharing in a never to be repeated proclamation, the preaching of the good news of God's kingdom throughout the earth. At the same time, we must keep sounding the warning. People need to know that the end of this wicked system is rapidly approaching. Then when that time of judgment arrives, they'll know that the message we pre preached came from Jehovah God. When Jesus died, he said, it's finished. The sin debt was paid. That's an accounting term to tell us die. It is finished, sealed, it's paid. There's no more work to be done to save people. Jesus did it. As Christians, we share this with people. This is what I do. I expose Watchtower for their lies to try to get people who are searching for truth to sort it all out. It's all about Jesus. He paid the sin debt because sin has wages. And what the law could not do in saving us, Jesus did for us in dying for us. So turn to Jesus, friends. He'll save you. It's a simple prayer. Thanks so much for watching, friends, and I hope you have a great day.